And we're going to introduce uh, today's panel who have been kind enough to join us today. So um, in alphabetical order, those are John Miller and his visiting uh, cat. Um, he is a retired but active fourth generation beekeeper, now devotes his life to his grandchildren, bee research and forage initiatives. The fifth generation of Millers now owns and operates Miller Honey Farms, which is based both in Gackle, New, uh, North Dakota and Newcastle, California. The Newcastle property also grows Awari Satsuma Mandarin Oranges, marketed locally in November and December. John is a former two-term chair of the National Honey Board and president of the California State Beekeepers Association. John's lived the American migratory beekeeping experience as profiled in the Beekeeper's Lament by Hannah Nordhaus and authors a monthly article in Bee Culture magazine. And most importantly, he is Papa to 11 grandchildren. The first Matthew of the day is Matthew Malika, a Senior Project Director with Keystone Policy Center, providing facilitation, mediation, and project management services within Keystone's natural resources and agricultural practice areas. Matt works with diverse public, private, and NGO stakeholder groups and designs and facilitates stakeholder dialogues, coalitions, and strategic planning processes. Matt manages and facilitates the Honeybee Health Coalition, which you heard about in the video, as well as Farmers for Monarchs. These coalitions include crop and beekeeper associations, agribusinesses, federal agencies, researchers, and other NGOs working on pollinator conservation. Our second Matthew is Dr. Matthew O'Neill, a professor in the Department of Entomology at Iowa State University. His lab studies both the pest and beneficial insects that use crop fields with a focus on soybean production. Uh, during the past 15 years, he's worked with the Multidisciplinary Strips Project to explore how pat small patches of native habitat, that is prairie, can address multiple conservation goals, including an improvement in honeybee productivity. And Dale Thornson is Assistant Director of the U.S. Canola Association and also joined Gordley Associates from the office of Senator Byron Dorgan of North Dakota, where he was responsible for farm policy and agricultural appropriations. Before coming to Washington, he managed his family's farm in North Dakota, and he brings his hands-on perspective to policy considerations. Dale's practice areas include farm policy, budget, and appropriations. So we've got a really neat and varied set of perspectives um, on, on beekeeping and bee issues uh, as they affect uh, both crop consultants and, and the farmers they serve. So let's talk about that. And I'm going to roll right in with a question for, uh, for you, Matt O'Neill, um, because it's been, it's been hanging in the Q&A for a while. And that is, do bees actually forage in soybeans? And I know that falls right into your world. It's a, um, what we call in my business a softball. So uh, can you hear me okay? Sure can. Yeah, uh, so uh, I've been here at Iowa State for about 17 years. I'm um, nominally referred to as the soybean entomologist. Um, we have two types of entomologists in Iowa, soybeans and corn. So I work on the soybean side. And about eight years ago, we started surveying insects uh, not only the pests, but also the beneficials and specifically uh, pollinators, looking at uh, whether bees are in soybean fields and what type and and when. And what we found was that um, pretty much uh, from uh, July through August, you can find bees in soybean fields. And uh, this involves um, maybe 50 some different species. And that's an underestimate because we didn't do a great job of identifying some of the very small bees. And then when we put honeybee hives next to soybean fields, yeah, you see uh, honeybees in those uh, fields foraging on uh, the flowers. And as your video pointed out, uh, when you look at those bees individually, you can find evidence of soybean pollen on them, indicating that you know they're they're actively in the flowers, they're you know pulling out nectar, and they're probably inadvertently getting some of the pollen on themselves as well. That's great. And and from the data you've seen, have the um, uh, have have soybean farmers seen good impacts or you know positive impacts uh, in in ways that have been quantified? Yeah, we, that's a really tricky uh, uh, question to address because uh, at the same time that there are um, 
honeybees and, and wild native bees in the field, they're also insect pests. And so it's a, a balancing act to uh, remove the insect pests, but uh, promote and uh, maintain the beneficial ones, especially the bees. We've had a couple of chances at uh, experiments where we've tried to measure the impact of honeybees and wild bees on soybeans and, uh, in terms of yield, and um, we haven't seen a significant impact. Uh, but some of that was um, challenged because of pest outbreaks that occur. And you know we didn't want to spray insecticide when the bees were present. Uh, some colleagues have studied this in the Midwest, especially in the South of the United States. And depending upon the variety of soybeans and the conditions, they can see an impact in yield uh, when honeybees and wild bees are uh, you know kind of promoted and and uh, present next to a soybean field. And I'm curious from John uh, and maybe some beekeepers. You know, what's their sense on the honeybee side of soybeans being a source of nectar? You know, because this is a two-way relationship. A soybean plant is um, producing flowers and, and possibly benefiting from pollination, but the honeybees are also foraging on those. And um, I'm curious in his uh, world, maybe in Dales too, up in North Dakota, if they see a honey yield uh, when they put honeybees next to their soybean fields. Daniel? Oh, to, to me first, I guess on our farm, we grow both canola and soybeans and uh, beekeepers will put their hives uh, near the canola fields. I guess they, they will seek those out before soybeans. And I guess uh, if a bee is given a choice of going to a soybean field or a canola field where they're being grown together, uh, they'll likely go to the canola. But then on the other hand, canola is blooming before soybeans, so it, it, they all kind of work together. And uh, that, that's one of the things that, that you know, we have tried to promote in the U.S. Canola Association is that uh, the canola crop will bloom in, in good conditions up to 30 days. And it's at a time when, when there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's usually late June into July. And it's for a commercial crop to provide that type of habitat with its pollen and, and nectar. Uh, it, it, you know, beekeepers do seek it out. And so we developed BMPs for the canola crop uh, to help producers, uh, you know, protect their crop if they need to, but also protect the bees. And I'll, I'll also add uh, canola, producing canola hybrid seed requires bees. Uh, if you talk to the seed producers, that is the most expensive component of their production system when they're producing commercial seed that we seed at our farm. They don't get any canola seed if they don't have bees. And so they, if they do have a pest problem, they, you know, they're going to protect their bees because that's the most important part. And then they have to decide if they remove those bees for a day or two to treat that pest, are they going to at that time, that plant will be producing and will not produce any seed. So will they lose more to the pest or will they lose more by not producing seed? So it, it's it's pretty involved. Yeah, for us up here, when I drive through Iowa in late June and I drive through North Dakota in late June, if I was growing soybeans in North Dakota, I'd quit because the soybeans look so much better in Iowa. Yet if Iowa, if soybeans yield honey, Iowa should be the number one honey state in the nation instead of North Dakota. So I'm not sure the bees, the bees are utilizing the beans, but I don't know how much honey, probably pollen, not much honey. Now I'm gonna reach in um, and ask uh, about the the timing of pollination, because that uh, Dale had mentioned, you know, that the timing when canola starts to bloom before soybeans and the timing of pollination seems to be an issue too, in terms of the benefits of good pollinator habitat. So John, your your bees are traveling, you know, back and forth around the country and, and you're looking at, at a, a really large map, um, both in terms of time and space. So what do you, what's important from a beekeeper's perspective in terms of timing, when do you need to see blooms out there and how important is having kind of a, 
uh, a span of blooming plants out there. Um, how important is that to you? Uh, we know when providing paid pollination services for pit fruit or for almonds, um, we know well, usually the agreements stipulate that we're on site within a period of time, certainly before 10% bloom. Um, in the old days when we used to go to dandelion and uh, high mountain valleys in Wyoming, it was get there before the bloom started. If showing up at peak of bloom is dumb. It's poor management. So uh, on the beans, I have no really first-hand experience specifically moving bees to sunflowers or to uh, soybeans, I'm sorry. Uh, I know on canola uh, contracts, we need to be there early. The trick is anchoring those bees into the target crop and getting them to stay on the target crop instead of wandering into other fields where they can get in trouble. Well, that's an interesting point. Um, looking looking beyond soybeans, so when we look at um, some of the other plantings that we're, we're trying to either encourage or just take, uh, take advantage of, so if you're bringing uh, bees into a given crop and you have to be there before 10% bloom, what are your bees, what's keeping those bees uh, and those colonies uh, strong and fed? Do you need other kinds of blooming plants? Does, does a farmer's planting forage um, in a corner or, or ditch help, help your colonies uh, get where they need to go um, while they're waiting for, uh, say, orchards to come into full bloom? Sure, that's an excellent, excellent observation. The, the almond industry is moving to forage uh, between the tree rows uh, because the, uh, for example, if we put down some rapinis, the tap root opens up that soil that may have compacted over years and allows better water penetration. Of course, the benefits these guys, these experts that I'm sharing the screen with, uh, know that uh, it improves the soil health to have those plants growing. And when I say anchoring, if, for example, the mustard is in bloom on the 1st of February in California, those bees will work that uh, mustard, the rapinis, and stay kind of within the orchard, that when the orchard does start blooming, almond pollen being much more attractive and much more nutritious, the bees will go to the almond tree first, then at 2.30 in the afternoon, three o'clock, they'll drop to the floor of the orchard after the almond bloom is stripped for the day and spend the rest of their day on the cover crop on the floor of the orchard and not go flying off and in getting into trouble. So uh, uh, strips between tree fruit and, and nut trees is, is gaining traction, real traction. It's a good thing and it's good for the bees. That's tremendous, um, and it's and it's good to know that that uh, fears of of distracting the bees from their their principal crop or you know the crop that they're they're on site for uh, is is you know don't seem to be a a big as big a concern as perhaps we had feared. I'm going to go to the uh, the Q and A uh, box, and there's a couple of questions about the best pollinator crops or flowers to grow if we're creating habitat um, or. Also, one related to that is what are the main plants in pollinator strips? And Matt, I'm going to point that uh, Matt O'Neill. I'm going to point that your way because I know you've been uh, close to the folks in the um, the Iowa State University Prairie Strips uh, group. So the the question is, what plants are most attractive or best for um, encouraging pollinators? Is that right? Um, so uh, there's a couple of ways to answer that. One is um, just what plants are most attractive. And uh, some of that work has been done and is available to the public through Michigan State University. And I'll put a, a, a link in the chat uh, to the panelists and the organizers if you can say, uh, uh, forward this on. Uh, Doug Landis at Michigan State University is an entomologist who screened the native plants that are common throughout the Midwest that would have been found in prairies, uh, looking at each individually to see how attractive they are to beneficial insects and also to pests. And uh, they have made this information public and you can go through and see the, oh, I think it's some 50 different flowering perennial 
plants that they've screened uh, and what insects are found on them and when they're flowering and, and how attractive they are to pollinators. We use that information when constructing the prairie strips that we've studied at Iowa State University and um, tried to build as attractive a native community of plants as we could that is close to what was here um, pre-settlement. So um, basically trying to reconstruct a prairie. And I wanted to point out something uh, that came up in the video. Uh, multiple times the uh, people in the video noted um, the importance of planting native plants. And I think it's important to highlight this because um, two things. One, many of the native plants in this part of the world are attractive to honeybees, especially those that flower late in the summer in August and September when the crops that we grow like canola and soybeans have stopped uh, flowering. What we found is that native uh, set of plants that are flowering in the fall provide what, what we call a prairie rescue effect. They allow the bees to keep growing, maintain uh, honey, uh, after things like soybean, clover, and canola are gone. Um, so that's one benefit for native plants. They're flowering after our, our crops are done. And then the other benefit is they've co-evolved with all of the native wild bees that are found in this area. So there's a tight relationship there between those wild bees that we see in decline and the plants that were once here. And so bringing them back in the landscape gives those wild bees a chance to uh, persist and possibly grow. Well, that all makes a lot of sense. And it, I guess, speaks to the idea that um, if you grow native plants, you're growing plants that are well suited to the, your environment, which means your success rate probably uh, improves. Yeah. It, yep. And, and many of them are um, fairly drought tolerant. So at a time like now in the Midwest, especially Iowa, where we're very dry, uh, some of those perennial flowering plants are really the only thing green. Um, and that's because they're perennial and they drop roots deep into the soil looking for what's available in times like now when it's really dry. That makes a lot of sense. Now, we're having a really neat conversation because we've got, you know, farmer, entomologist, uh, beekeeper, uh, policy people. Um, <coughs> what's, how, can, how can people engage in these kinds of conversations in, uh, in their local area. And Matt Mulica, I'm going to point this to you. Um, what kind of um, what kind of opportunities are there to to connect beekeepers and farmers uh, in, in a given area to start these kind of dialogues? Sure. Um, you, know, you know, I think a lot of times beekeepers will, you know, knock on doors and, and have local relationships. They don't often have, um, you know, enough land to place their bees. Uh, where they they need ag lands, and so um, you know in the past that's that's been a relationship where just a you know a, a case of honey has been been provided to the to the landowner, um, and so you know I think you know the opportunities to have that conversation about you know what kind of management practices you're you're putting on the ground if you're the if you're the farmer, um, and uh, you know communicate with your beekeeper with a beekeeper if you're you know gonna gonna spray something if you're having some press pressure. Um, and, and really just have a deeper conversation about, um, you know, what to do in, in the case of a, a, un, a unanticipated pest pressure. Um, and, um, you know, really, uh, I think that's it. It's, it's, it's you know, that communication and um, having the, um, you know, a good relationship where where you have the each other's phone numbers. And if there is, you know, a, a a need to communicate to you know you so quickly um and uh, you know otherwise uh you know if you're if you're a, a beekeeper um you know there's a lot of uh you know clubs and, and local um you know, associations that you can go to um we also have just a variety of materials from the honeybee health coalition um, we have corn, canola, and soybean BMPs that we've developed with the crop associations. We're developing apple BMPs, and then we also have um, a lot of materials for beekeepers. So um, all, all good uh, resources to start that conversation. That's great. Thank you.
And, and I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in on the BMPs, and I'm I'm watching the Q and A box uh, for new questions. So if anyone's got questions out there, please feel free to type them into the Q and A box or the questions box. Um, but in the meantime, when we're talking about BMPs, Dale, you've been involved with the Canola BMP. Can you tell me a little bit about why the Canola Association thought that that was uh, that was an important undertaking? Well, simply because. Uh, we're all in this together, and uh, bees are attracted to canola, and it's a fact. And it's a crop, but so are the so are the bees uh, and the and the honey that they produce. And the fact is, sometimes a crop does need to be sprayed, but if but you can do that if you if you follow your management practices and use the least uh, the least toxic uh insecticide and spray at times when the bees aren't present and uh you know you can coexist and the other thing was uh you know one of the probably the most uh one of the biggest insect pests for canola is actually when it's emerging and uh that's requires well, the best management tool for that is is a neonicotinoid C treatment, and when you say neonicotinoids and bees in the same sentence, you know people get pretty excited. Uh, but there are there are not bees present when when the seed is treated, and the residual of that is only you know at best last two weeks, and you know at you know from the time of planting to the emergence, and under heavy pressure, if the crop doesn't emerge in the spring quickly that that insecticide will wear off and you still need to use foliar applications which are not the best because then you're 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 hitting you know uh good insects as well beneficial insects but uh the beekeepers uh or you know through the honey bee health coalition they have we, we have worked together to try to keep our seed treatments in place which also increases canola acreage, which also helps bees. So I mean, in cooperation, we have been able to, um, you know, help each other out. Put it that way. And my, when I got involved with the Honey Bee Health Coalition, I think it was in 2014. I didn't know much about bees. Now I know enough to be dangerous, and I I would not want to be a beekeeper. That's got to that is the toughest job that I've ever could imagine in the world. I, you know, I used to think about, uh, you know, uh, milking cows being tough, but uh, at least your cows stay in one place and you don't have to drag them all over the country. <laughs> so, uh, beekeepers have a tough road to hold, and anything we could do to help them, I think, is helping everybody. And we need them. We need them for pollinating uh, pollination benefits for all a lot of the crops. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now that's that that leads to uh, an, an interesting question in terms of John, your experience. I mean, here you've got a uh, uh, a farmer who's who's got a new appreciation for for your side of the the conversation or your profession. What do you wish farmers knew about beekeeping or beekeepers? What do I wish farmers knew? I think farmers. You know, I've got a lot of admiration for farmers. Um, I can cite my bees out of harm's way and still pollinate canola very adequately, but gosh, don't put your bees in the field. Put your bees in the buffer strips or an eighth of a mile away. You know, give some respect to the farmer and his management practices too. If I could speak to the farmers, I, I keep hearing this theme over and over again, is like, don't farm every square inch of your property because there are marginal areas that are either tough to get to or not productive. And those are ideal places for little nutrition oasis for the beneficials because um, from a bee guy's point of view, we're not going to alter USDA policy, which is to pave this country with corn and beans. And, and, and to apply the better seed mixes that USDA paid the research to document the better seed mixes than the CP42. It costs less money, it's more productive, it's better for soil health, it supports a 
broader diversity of species and they don't use it. If I could speak to farmers, I, I, I would, I would A, sympathize with them on this tough year because this drought took everybody and there isn't a darn thing a canola grower or a bean grower or a bee guy can do about this tough year. So I, I just think this, this, this theme of, 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 of marginal acres being repurposed, uh, I think it's got legs because I keep hearing it. That's what I'd share with farmers. So taking that on, Matt O'Neill, um, if I'm squaring off a, a field and you know, or or planting uh, uh, just a wet spot into into some native uh, uh, pollinator habitat, am I really changing much? I mean, I, I, I you know, does a little does a little planting help in any substantial way, or do we need to you know put 10,000 acres in a county to uh, to pollinate or habitat to make a difference. Uh, do you want the short answer or the long answer? Uh, go for it. We've got 12 more minutes. <laughs> the short answer is yes. And the long answer is, oh, yeah, uh, uh, very much so. Um, so small patches uh, can have a big impact, especially, as John pointed out, if they're thoughtfully designed and located. What we found with the Prairie Strips project is, if those small patches of prairie are put at the base of a hill or water you know, catchment, uh, they're going to collect sediment, they're going to collect the nutrients that would have run into the watershed. So they're, they're preventing soil erosion in that regard. And when they're a mixture of um, multiple species of grasses and these flowering forbs, they're a resource uh, that complements the crop. So one of the things I think you've heard from John and Dale is, look, bees are in those crops, depending upon how attractive they are. Uh, but when those crops are gone, um, the bees are going to need something else to feed on, either before or after that. And what we've found in Iowa is the prairie strips have these flowering plants that come on in late August and September, and they're a reservoir, they're a resource um, after those crops have stopped flowering. And what we found in a three-year study was that for you know small apiaries, uh, we could increase the productivity of the honeybees by about 24%, more honey produced in those hives at farms with prairie strips than without. And we're seeing pretty good results this year too when we've upped the numbers to 20 hives per location. And I don't think it's because, uh, you know, I think the prairie strip alone is a resource, but it's a resource that complements the resource of the adjacent crops, especially when That's it great. comes to honeybee keeping. That's tremendous. So there's really a, um, a, a holistic uh, sense of crop and, and, and native pollinator um, or, or pollinator plot. I want to speak yeah. to the... Oh, sorry. Whoop. Oh, no, have at it. Well, I was just, I, I know you're running out of time, but just to echo something that John also said was, you know, the um, the precision ag technologies that allow farmers to see where their fields are yielding the most and the least is something that we've heard from farmers who have adopted prairie strips before it became a conservation reserve practice. And they said, look, I know I'm taking land out of production, you know, when I put these perennial patches in, but when it's in a part of the field that cost me money to farm, my net return has increased uh, in that field. So um, there's a nice um, interlap or interlap, is that, did I just create a word? Uh, overlap between, you know, these kind of high tech tools that farmers have available to them and some old school conservation that can lead to more productive farming. Uh, I, I can just add to that by saying, we have the yield maps on our farm uh they're harvesting right now and even in this tough year along the canadian border north of minot uh, we have sections of the wheat field that are running up to 60 70 80 bushels to the acre that's kind of amazing but we also have parts of the field that are zero and those are the tough parts and we have those yield maps when we apply fertilizer in those tough areas they're not getting much fertilizer in those good areas, they're getting more fertilizer. They're taking that one step farther uh, in the coming years. They signed up for parcels of CRP, and where they can, they're going to be putting in these beneficial, you know, areas. 
uh, and you know you won't be farming that area that has a zero yield and you won't be putting any inputs into it and that makes that field much much more uh, uh, profitable and it provides something for habitat and it's a win-win well and you brought up a great point dale you mentioned crp and and so not only do do these acres in some cases um uh, come out of production and 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 stop draining funds your you know a uh, uh, profit but but you can at least get a uh, a rental payment on it so i know your association got really involved in um working with the federal government to get uh uh crop diversification in canola on the on the docket or on the books as part of uh, CSP. Tell me a little bit about why that's important and, and what what's coming next um, as far as uh, as far as your um, diversifying crop rotations project goes. It, you know, we're not going to, um, canola and I get, you know, the other crop we represent in our office, sunflowers, they're not going to take over the world, at least not in the United States. But adding a few acres of those crops uh, diversifying your rotation there is a place for it in many places uh, not many people know that canola is also a winter crop there's it's like winter wheat and spring wheat uh it, it it'll, it'll grow in the southeast uh, there was a substantial acres acreage in the great southern great plains here a while back but you know uh prices and you know it's a, it's it can be a tough crop as well but um for, you know, if you could get people to try the crop and if they have a place to sell it, uh, maybe it can be part of the rotation. And, you know, you, uh, we have in the southeast, we have, you know, research that shows uh, you plant the canola in the fall instead of winter wheat. And then it comes off a little earlier than winter wheat. Then you plant soybeans after that. Your soybean yield is five to ten percent more on canola versus wheat because it's seeded a little earlier, and you know it's uh, and you grow a double crop of oil. <laughs> so it there there are places for this. It just it, it takes an effort, and it doesn't mm -hmm. even doesn't even displace soybeans in the in the case of of, of winter canola. That's great. So we can really take a bigger picture view. Matt uh, O'Neill, I'm going to ask you a little bit about the um, the program side of Prairie Strips um, because they're they're part of the CRP program, right? How does that work? That's right. So um, in the 2018 Farm Bill, the um, practice of Prairie Strips was added to the Conservation Reserve Program. It's now CP43, and I can send you a link to the uh, fact sheet put out by the USDA and Farm Services for what that would in, involve if a farmer wanted to enlist uh, acres in their field in that program. Um, there's a fair amount of flexibility uh, in terms of where in the field the um, prairie strips could be established, if it's you know at a field edge or embedded within the field, um, but there are some guidelines in that fact sheet to help farmers get the most out of that practice. And hopefully they got the sense from our conversation in the video that, um, you know, if you're thoughtful in where it's placed and, and the configuration, there's benefits for, you know, preventing soil erosion, nutrient loss, but also biodiversity. And the goal of that flexibility is to help farmers put it in the places where they need it most in terms of, you know, taking unproductive land out of production, but also delivering on some of these other ecosystem services. And if you go to our website, and um, I think the link was shared in the chat, but I promise you it's safe for work. If you Google strips at ISU, you'll find uh, um, a bunch of information and testimonials from farmers about how they put this into practice on their farms. And then um, we have a, a, a farmer uh, a liaison, Tim Youngquist, who works with farmers at Iowa uh, to help them uh, put this into practice. That's tremendous. And you'll actually see Tim if you go to our website and look at the bonus content. So that's kind of yep. cool. He's uh, he's a great resource. Matt Mulica, we've got about another minute or two. And I know that the Honeybee Health Coalition has a bunch of um, resources that uh, farmers, crop consultants can get at 
Can you just tell us kind of what's available and where they might be able to find it? Sure. So, um, you know, the Honey Bee Health Coalition was was found in uh, 2014, as Dale said, and, and we really are at the intersection of, of agriculture and beekeeping and with the general idea that, you know, we can have both. We can have productive crops and we can have uh, healthy hives. And so uh, along that vein, we've brought together crop associations, uh, beekeeping associations, agribusiness researchers, uh, government agencies, um, really to, to develop uh, materials for farmers and for beekeepers to, to kind of realize this, this vision of, of uh, healthy crops and healthy bees. Um, so if you go to honeybeehealthcoalition.org, um, you can find um, a variety of BMPs uh, for, for, for crops, um, also information for pesticide applicators. Um, you can find, uh, you know, f basic infographics. We have, uh, you know, single, single sided sheets that are uh, talk about the beekeeper and the growers roles. So as you have bees on or adjacent to uh, ag lands, uh, what do you need to know uh, in, in a, in a, you know, front to back piece of paper? It, it, you know, really taking a lot of complicated information and trying to boil it down to something that is really useful and, and, and you know, implementable on the ground for both growers and beekeepers. So uh, we worked hard to, to, uh, to develop materials um, for beekeepers and growers. And um, as I mentioned before, we have corn, canola and soybean BMPs that, that follow the, uh, the growing cycle from planting to harvest and talk about those times when um, when when the growers can have the uh, the greatest positive impact on on bee health, um, and also how to mitigate exposure. Uh, so it's all at honeybeehealthcoalition.org, um, and and check it out. It's all free, um, and we'll continue to develop these these BMPs. Uh, as I said, we're we're developing apples next. Um, there's also the Bee Integrated Demonstration Project. Uh, we're developing a number of videos uh, that that uh, talk you know talk with beekeepers and growers who have successful relationships and, and what they're putting in on the ground um, to, to have that uh, that healthy bees and, and healthy crops. So uh, awesome. check it out. Thank you. Perfect. Um, I've got, there's a question that came up. Is there a program similar to prairie strips in the Northeastern US? So I'm putting that out there. I don't think we have time to answer it, but um, I, would, uh, I would ask uh, the questioner, uh, Judith Artley, to get in touch with me or either of the mats and let's see if we can run down an answer for you. Um, in the meantime, I wanna thank uh, John and Dale, Matt and Matt for being part of today's panel. I know that this uh, closes down real quick when the time is up. Um, thank you to our sponsors and I'm gonna hand it back to Chris Boomsman to bring us all home. Thanks folks. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone else. I appreciate your uh, your uh, service today and for speaking to this great audience. And thanks, everyone in the audience, for joining today and offering up questions. We do recommend, of course, that you come back for session six next week, Regenerative Agriculture. We hope you can join us.